thank all of you for coming out this evening. I'd like to introduce Rod Mil Milne. Did I say that right? Milne. Say it again. Milne. Milne. Okay. Um, he's the curator of the Sedgwick, Can Sedgwick, Kansas, not the Sedgwick County, but the Sedgwick, Kansas Historical Museum. And they've just moved a, an old uh, train depot there to be on their grounds. And Rod became fascinated with this tombstone in Sedgwick that said William Longwood on it. You wonder who that was? And his search brought him to Sumner County, brought him to the courthouse, brought him into our research center. And the more he talked, the more interesting the whole tale was. And so I called him and I said, would you come talk about that? And he agreed, thank you, Rod. So I'd like to introduce Rod from Sedgwick, Kansas. Please welcome him. I was born in Sedgwick uh, in 1949 and spent the first 20 years of my life in the little town. It was about 1,000 people then. And one of the things that we did in the dead of summer when there was nothing else to do was ride our bikes around the countryside. And one of the trips that we took was uh, invariably out to the cemetery. And we would uh, walk along and, and uh, look at the graves, estimate the ages of the people, wonder how they died, things like that. And there was one grave that kind of was off by itself and it was this one here, William Wolf, who was born in 1879, died in 1917. Nobody in town seemed to know uh, anything about this guy, except that we had, uh, in the historical museum, we had a little tin sign that said, William Lone Wolf, Blacksmith. And who saved it, and how many years it had been in the museum, I don't know. But, Anyway, I, uh, the first step I made uh, in my uh, research was to Google, which everybody kind of asks where you start. You Google it and see what comes up. Fortunately, uh, William Lone Wolf uh, attended Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania, and they have a resource online, a digital resource of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of information about different uh, uh, students, uh, letters, uh, some of them were families begging to have their children sent back to them. Uh, a lot of them had to do with financing and funding, but anyway, there was enough on Learnable for me to find out that he had spent a few years here in Sumner County. Uh, in Ashton, Kansas. And I need to go back a little bit, but he was a Kiowa. He was born in the, in the Kiowa Reservation. The uh, first map there is the grounds of the Plains Indians prior to the reservation system, the tribal system. And the Kiowa, uh, Cheyenne, Comanche, uh, Apache, there were lots of Plains tribes that were pretty more or less free to roam that area. And of course, if they had enemies or places to avoid, they just didn't camp there. There was plenty of room for everybody and uh, plenty of buffalo, and they lived a pretty good life out on the Plains. Well, in 1876, no, sorry, the um, the Medicine Lodge Treaty, it was that. the Medicine Lodge Treaty of 1867 sent the Kiowa, the Kiowa, no, I just, oh, oh, okay. the uh, Kiowa and the Comanche and the Plains Apache were assigned this little piece of Oklahoma right here. And I say a little piece, it was about two and a half million acres of reservation for those three tribes. And the three tribes moved down to this area and uh, started their suffering and poverty. They were, uh, they were scattered throughout different clans, different tribes, and different places. And the United States government was responsible 
for making sure that they had supplies, they were supposed to get farming equipment, uh, train loads of uh, flour and things like that came from uh, Chicago and New York and just about every stop between there and the reservation somebody stole some of the stuff off of it. Uh, took a little off the top, took a few barrels of flour. By the time it got down to the reservation and was distributed by the Army, which was in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, pretty close to up in the middle of the reservation. By the time it got down there, there wasn't enough to go along and uh, go around. So uh, it, was a, it was a pretty miserable existence, even on the reservation with that much land. I get down there and it's just rolling grassland, uh, pretty arid, very little really arable farmland. Uh, most of it uh, now is used for cattle grazing. The uh, Dawes Act of 1877 took that two and a half million dollar reservation and divided it into allotments. They decided that uh, there were two settlers wanted that land worse than the Indians. So they divided it into allotments. They gave every family 160 acres plus 80 acres for a wife and I think 40 acres per child. At that time they took the census and, and allotted land. Uh, it wasn't all allotted to the Indians, not even half of it was. And the allotments that weren't uh, used by the Indians to live were sold to white settlers. Well, at that time, they had gone from this free tribal uh, existence to a reservation existence. And now they were in the third stage of existence, which entailed uh, trying to make living on, on these little patches of land. The, the third phase was called the progressive, progressive phase. And it came from a man named Richard Pratt, who was a colonel in the Army. And his idea was that they, we were never going to solve the Indian problem until we got rid of the Indians. And before him, genocide was a fairly popular idea to make room for the white settlers. Uh, in fact, um, it, uh, there were several massacres during the, the early years and, and clear up to 1890, there were Indian massacres by people who believed that until we cleared the planet of Indians, this couldn't be a, a, a decent country. So, the allotments scattered the tribes, scattered the families. Uh, they tried to make sure that each family was surrounded by white settlers so the Indians could learn the right way to live. Uh, and it also broke up their, their uh, family life, their tribal life. But uh, when they moved to the reservation, one of the elder was uh, the chief and he, he was a scrappy guy he was in a lot of uh, battles with with the army uh, he did sign the treaty of the little arkansas 1865 which moved the tribes south of the arkansas river but he refused to sign the medicine lodge treaty in 1867 uh, to move to reservation uh, he fought the whites uh, the Battle of Bodie Walls, Palo Verde Canyon, uh, several other uh, battles. Uh, he was a terror. He was in prison at Fort Marion, Florida in 1879 and stayed in Florida until about four months before he died. He was dying of tuberculosis. And they finally let him uh, free. He went home to the reservation and died four months later. He uh, was sort of the grandfather of the person that I'm talking about. And the reason I say sort of is that the names do not necessarily follow bloodlines. This guy had a son who was killed in battle. 
and his son, uh, or a friend of his son, who was Mama Day, went down into Texas where uh, the chief's son was killed, found the body, brought it back, and as a reward, as an honor, uh, Lone Wolf gave Mama Day his name. So I, I refer to him as Lone Wolf the Younger. He was more than likely the, uh, the Lone Wolf that adopted William Lone Wolf after birth. This is William. Uh, he was adopted into the Kyra tribe as an infant. We know nothing about his parents, who his natural mother and father were, but we do know that uh, by the, the Carlisle records that he looked more Afro African American than he did Indian. And my thought is that probably that at that time Fort Sill was supplying the tribes there on the reservation and uh, there was a huge contingency of black Union soldiers that were sent west after the Civil War. And more than likely these black soldiers uh, were responsible for uh, uh, getting the, the commodities to the, to the families and tribes and, and evidently uh, really well wolf was a product of uh, probably a black soldier and a Kiowa woman. When he was pretty young, I, I haven't found the date exactly, but he was sent from Oakland, it's from uh, the reservation, or what used to be the reservation, to Chilaco. Uh, that's not too far from here. If you're familiar with it, just south of our city uh, in Oklahoma, a little ways. Uh, he attended there from 1885 to 1892. And that's a pretty grim place. The idea was, and as uh, Colonel Pratt put it, we will kill the Indian to save the man. They decided that the only way to, to, to save the Indian was to get them away from their religion, from their culture, from their families, from their tribal traditions, everything. So when the kids got there, they came from over 100 tribes throughout the United States to Chilaco. They were all uh, native clothes were taken, any uh, tokens or uh, medicine bags, anything relating to any kind of religion or faith was taken from them. Their hair was cut and uh, they started uh, school to learn English and, and learn the basics of uh, white uh, culture. They went to classes a few hours in the mornings and every afternoon was spent in hard labor because they believed to assimilate they had to learn a work ethic. And so the boys spent the better part of their time breaking rocks to build uh, dozens of buildings. Uh, the, the women, the girls were uh, washing all the lawn, doing the laundry, doing all the cooking, and, and all that. So they basically supported the school that, that they were sent to. By the way, if anybody has questions, feel free. Uh, it, there are over 100 buildings on, on the grounds. It's closed now, of course, but uh, the, the male students uh, worked also with the farms. Uh, they raised their own food. Students recall that there were 22 bugle calls per day at Chilaco. It was run as a military operation. The kids wore uh, wool uniforms. Uh, they were all dressed the same. Uh, they had skinny meals, they had adequate health care, physical abuse. Uh, there were a lot of children that died and their parents never never knew what happened to them. Uh, the parents were almost forced to sign permission slips to, to get their kids, but, and also some of the Indian agents would sign for the parents to get the kids to Chilaco. And 
that there really it was it was a sign of desperation to send your own child away like that. But uh, the life in, in the reservation and all the allotments was was unbearable enough that the parents thought that maybe their kids would have a chance if they sent them away. This is uh, Colonel Pratt. Uh, he he started his career down in the in Florida. Uh, teaching the prisoners, the Indian prisoners, English in, in the prison. And later on, he uh, started a little college called Hampton. Well, he did start, it started as a, a, a school for free slaves. But he sent about 40 uh, adult Indians to uh, Hampton to continue with this assimilation process, trying to convince them that the white way was the best way. Uh, you can see by the picture that there were a lot of kids there at any one time. Now, Chalaco was, or Carlisle, after he left Chalaco, he went to Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania. He was there for about two and a half years. Now, Carlisle uh, was similar to Chalaco in the it was a military uh, atmosphere, uniforms, marching, uh, physical punishment. Um, no way you were punished severely for talking, uh, speaking in your native tongue, or uh, even mentioning anything about your tribal affiliations. The uh, the college, like Chalanco, expected these kids to learn a work ethic. And what they did was send these kids on what they called outings. Now, William Underwood was there for two and a half years. And as near as I can figure, he was in a classroom for maybe six months. And the rest of the time, he was sent on these outings where they were assigned to uh, good Christian families in Pennsylvania or somewhere, more an indentured servant than anything else, but they were assigned to these families to learn wide ways and uh, to possibly learn a trade. First of all, they ended up just working farm hands. Uh, the first item that William went on, he was away from the school for a year. He, he was on two others. Uh, he was gone for six months one time and about eight months for another time. Uh, farmed out to families. The last year he was there, uh, he spent several months on campus because they put him on the football team. And uh, evidently they figured that his, uh, uh, his athletic ability was worth more to him than, than having him on an outing. The outing was paid the students five dollars a month Half of the money was sent back to Carlisle. Now, there are a lot of advantages to this for the Carlisle people that would fulfill the assimilation idea of uh, teaching these uh, kids uh, wide ways. They didn't have to pay for their meals, they didn't have to pay for their lodging, and they would get two and a half dollars a month back uh, from, from all the families that the kids were assigned to. That would enable them to show on their books that they were uh, they were taking care of a lot more kids than they were because a lot of them were just out there uh, on these outings. The uh, the girls served as domestic servants usually. Uh, the boys largely for farm labor. A few of them were sent even to the uh, Ford Motor Plant in Detroit to learn uh, mechanics. And uh, the, the Ford Company did take a few students there. Uh, hundreds of the children died while they were away from school. And usually they just disappeared. Uh, there's been some research done in the last few years. Uh, uh, an organization, I can't remember the name of it, but it's uh, located in several graves of children who were on an outing, got sick and died, or something happened, an accident, and they were, they were buried, nobody was notified, the families never knew where they were. 
Well, it, it too was a pretty great place. This picture is of the classroom, the blacksmithing classroom at Carlisle. And I said that uh, William played football for one season. It's funny, he, he, he played football for one season. There's no record of his uh, achievements uh, on the field. But after, later on, when he started reading the newspapers, and I'll get to that shortly, uh, he was always listed as a star football player from Carlisle and a football hero. Uh, now, after he, several years after William left, Carlisle, they did have an outstanding football team under Pop Warner. And uh, actually, the, the high point of a lot of these kids' lives was the time that they beat the Army team, the U.S. Army team, on, on the gridiron. Uh, one of it's kind of a sad victory in a way, but it, it, they, were, they were a rough crew. And, and the football team at Carlisle invented a lot of things that are integrated into the, into the game today. Uh, forward pass was invented by the Carlisle people. Because before, uh, you grabbed the ball and you ran until somebody knocked you down. And suddenly the Indians decided, well, why can't we throw it to somebody else? And so every year, the, the commission, whatever it was, would have to sit down and look at the things that Carlisle did on the field and say, well, show it the allowance of all the rules. And one of, one of the rules they did uh, uh, post was you couldn't punch a man in the face anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so so they, they improved the game a little bit. But the third pass and a lot, lots of sneaky plays were invented by that team. Uh, he left Carlisle in 19, 1895, I believe, and I have a gap in my research, <coughs> which everybody does, but uh, this one is about 15 years after he left Carlisle, there's no record of him. Uh, my assumption is that well, since he was trained as a blacksmith, he probably just started working. He, he, he spent his whole life in, in military schools and learning uh, uh, white culture and white economics and white politics. He was a very intelligent man. So my assumption is that he worked for those 15 years and saved his money. In 1904, uh, he was at Haskell College in Lawrence, Kansas. I believe he was teaching blacksmithing there, and he met uh, a, a sack fox woman by the name of Manny Gray Eyes, and they were married. The next time he shows up in anything that I found was 1911, when in Ashton they uh, had a little notice in the paper. By the way, the most of the research was done on newspapers.com, which is a, that you have to pay for, but it's a website that gives you access to newspapers all over the United States from the 1700s to the present. It's an incredible site. Uh, I just found out a few days ago that Kansas, the state of Kansas has a site that gives me exactly the same form for free. <laughs> I had just said that I had just said that my membership in newspapers.com for sixty-five dollars for a year. And then found out it was the Kansas State Historical Society has the same information. Uh, the first indication that he was in Sumner County in the little town of Ashton was this little square that says Mr. Lowe was moved into the McElhenney house which he recently purchased. This is the first indication to me that he had some money uh, to, to come into a, to a new situation and buy a house. There's more here, and I doubt, I don't know if you can read it or not. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lord Wolf of Ashton were in the city yesterday having made the trip in a new auto Mr. Lone Wolf purchased last week. Mr. Lone Wolf is a blacksmith and is perhaps one of the hardest working Indians that ever struck a lick. 
He is much of an exception to the rules, and although he has a hand right and plenty of land, that, that was his allotment to the other Oklahoma plus the farmland he bought. And a nice little sum of money, he hammers away at the anvil and is one of the best blacksmiths in the state. It would be well if a few good ones like Mr. Wormwolf would be scattered among the different reservations as a living example of industry and thrift for the rest of the red men to pattern from. Uh, he was a good Indian. in Ashton for about three years and he had a neighbor by the name of George McCone and uh, evidently George and, and William the paper said that they got into an argument over a baseball game but when I started reading the testimony from the trial after the uh, this crime was committed uh, Cohen was the key on K-E-O-W-N was the name. Uh, called William names when he saw it. And the name, of course, being looking more black than Indian, because of the call of the nigger. And Werewolf evidently just had enough of it one day. And he and a bunch of people from Ashton, a bunch of guys were gathered around us the old store was still standing out there. It's one of a few buildings in Ashton. But uh, they were standing around, and McCone and his boys went by the wagon. And William said, I'm going to kill that man. And the guys tried to talk him out of it. And William had to look very close to town on the edge because he walked over to his house. He got his rifle, and as the wagon went by, he shot George in the back. It was a little single shot going to. Uh, he went into his house and he stayed there the rest of the day. The whole town of Ashton stood around in his yard waiting for him to come out. And fortunately, he had the sense not to come out. Uh, but when the sheriff got there, then he uh, uh, surrendered and was taken to the Sumner County Jail, from the wall to jail, which one was at that time. At the trial, Lone Wolf swore all along he did know that there was dozens of witnesses. Um, but he didn't say a word during the trial, he just sat there and listened. Uh, they ended the case in um, uh, September, I believe, of 1913. Brown and Gary sentenced him to one to five years in the penitentiary. He was, sent, he was sentenced in 1913, September. In October, the state of Kansas wrote to the sheriff of Sumner County and said, Lone Wolf owes us $265 or something. So we want you to seize his property and, uh, and hold any land, any property he has. The sheriff wrote back to the state and said, Lone Wolf doesn't own anything. In Sumner County. So one of two things happened. Either the sheriff and Lone Wolf were buddy enough that he just lied for him, or somehow between September and uh, September and November, his wife and, and uh, managed to get rid of all his property. And I don't know where her and the kids went. They had six kids. Uh, my guess is that you probably, while he was in prison, went back down to uh, uh, Oklahoma and stayed with relatives. So he did about a year and a half in Lansing Prison, a model prisoner, very good friends with the, uh, the, with the warden there. In fact, later on, uh, the warden was, uh, lost his job for borrowing money from prisoners. And Lone Wolf was one of the prisoners that was loaning money to the world, which probably was short of his sentence. But <laughs> uh, anyway, that's a whole other story. He, uh, so when he got out of prison, somebody 
helped him find an opening. And they said they need a black thing to serve with Kansas. And Lord Wolf went to Sedgwick and bought a blacksmith shop and, and started, uh, uh, started a business there. There was just some of the headlines. Now this one headline says, Ends Lord Wolf Case, Indian and Negro Wife Make the Most most of case for defense, and I, that's the only uh, the only thing I've ever seen that called her black. I think that that, that was a mistake. And of course, one little guilty Indian athlete unable to fool jury. Um, in uh, let's see, I don't have a date on that. 1913. There was a note in the Wellington paper that Mr. Chapman's been remodeled in the house by the Lord Wolf and has greatly improved his appearance. So evidently, uh, at least by that time, everything was gone. When he got to Sedgwick, he wanted everyone to know that he was not African American, he was an Indian. And the name of his blacksmith shop was the New Indian Blacksmith Shop. He said, we'll treat you right with honest prices and all work guaranteed. Give me a try and I'll show you what fine work an Indian can do. I purchased the blacksmith shop formerly owned by John Mulder and will be pleased to meet all of the customers as well as new. Ten years experience William Rowell proprietor. Uh, this add or one similar to a grand in the Soviet Pancraft for about a year. It was a weekly paper. And uh, every ad he put in the paper had some notation that I am an Indian. This is an Indian blacksmith shop. I can this Indian can do the best work that you'll find anywhere. So he really emphasized that. And this uh, of course, is the sign I was telling you about that I saw in the Art Museum, uh, a little bit up. And the reason it was a little bit up was in uh, May of 1917, a tornado came through, and then uh, suddenly, several small towns ended up killing 26 people, and William was one of them. He had. Uh, made a very successful uh, career in Sedgwick. He was a member of the Congregational Church. His wife played the piano, and he played the cornet, and, and uh, they did uh, concerts in church. His kids all went to Sunday school there. Um, there's, I have a note. Oh, this, this is another note from, this is from the Topeka Daily State Journal, for some reason, 1912, when he was still in Ashton. It says, uh, quite often a handsome four-door latest model touring car, driven by an Indian, may be slipping noiselessly up and down the streets of Wellington. In the back seat will be observed a neatly dressed and stylish-looking helpmate and four little black-eyed pacooses, making taking in the signs as they ride by. This is William Longwell and family from Ashton in this county doing their shopping in the latest pale face fashion. Longwell is just a little past 30 and is counted as one of the most prosperous farmers in Southeast Sumner County. Uh, the year that he spent on those atoms of working for these rich farmers, uh, he, was, he was putting it all together. He was figuring out this, how the white man's world worked, how you made money, how you saved money, how you, how you invested money. And uh, uh, there, there's another article that talks about him going to Art City and his wife uh, bought a player piano that uh, they had hauled to their farm. So although he was uh, working as a blacksmith in Sedgwick, he was very respected. And uh, it was really a tragedy when the guy died, but uh, he had run to the barn on his house. And once inside the barn, 
uh, the tornado hit and it just exploded the barn. Uh, he was found several hundred feet away, uh, taken to the hospital and moved him and died the next day. Again, I have another gap in my research. I don't know what happened to Manny, Greg, Isaac, his wife, and their kids. Uh, part of it, the, anybody that's done research knows how frustrating it is to come to a dead end in a genealogical search or something like that. And I, I've run into a lot of them. I'm not anywhere close to done with this guy. Uh, he's, he's kind of gotten into my head a little bit. So I'll continue my research. Rob, um, what part of Cedric did they live? Like, what part of Cedric did they live? They lived in the south east corner of Sedgwick. Do you familiar with Sedgwick? Yes, I'm a cousin. I'm a cousin. Holy mackerel, how long has it been, kid? The last funeral? That's about right. Oh my no, God. Now, I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, we did. And the subject is, is a pretty little town. It, it says right on the county line between Harvey County and Sedgwick County. It's officially Harvey County, but First Street and Sedgwick, the other side of it is Sedgwick County. Uh, and that's the result of one of those famous Kansas County seat fights with Newton and, and Sedgwick lost. So this tornado that that he was killed in there in Cedric. Is that what happened to the southeast corner of the cemetery? Yeah. Okay. The cemetery is a mile east of, uh, of town, and the tornado took off the south, uh, went across the southeast corner. There's still no tombstones out there, but there's a lot of roads. So, uh, in fact, they are slowly starting to use that property they have uh, uh, a friend of mine digs the graves out there and he has had to move over a few feet when he gets a coffin or something you know, because it's all unmarked all the headstones and everything were blown away uh, any questions did they not keep track like we do here where everybody's buried at at Cedric so they would know where he was at? Uh, by 1917, up to 1917, they really did. No uh, drawings, no anything? There's, I, I haven't found anything that would indicate who's buried where. Uh, the cemetery was moved once. It was close to town when they first started the town. And uh, they uh, told one of the guys that lived there that we'll give you that property if you'll leave up all the bodies and move them out of town. Okay. And so he did, he got most of them. <laughs> but the still there was that there's a few that are in somebody's backyard in the newer editions. Yeah. Uh, now for people who haven't been to Sedgwick, it's Ridge Road. Yeah. Well, my friend Sherry and her ex-husband used to have the North Ridge Pine tree farm. Yes. So where from there, before you get into Cedric, is that cemetery? Okay, if you're going north up Ridge Road from Wichita, uh, the first street in Cedric is First Street. Okay. You turn east there and go out of town a mile and hillside cemetery. Okay. So, uh, I would encourage anybody that has got a little time and, and, and has some basic computer skills, which is all I've got, to grab a hold of, a, of an ancestor or somebody you've heard about or even a famous person and just start a search because it's it's like a detective story. You just jump from one clue to the next. And when I started, I had his birth date and his death date. And I put it on timeline. And then when I find something that would tell me where he was at a certain time, I'd find it on that timeline. And slowly it would start to fill up. And if there were more things happening within a year or two period, and I could get on the timeline, I'd start to spell that timeline to take track and uh, keep track of that. And uh, to just slowly put that together. 
You could never find any of those kids in Oklahoma from any of the reservations. I have tried. Um, I went. I didn't even throw it down there. Uh, what about her maiden name? Well, she didn't have a maiden name. She did. No. Uh, but they did. These kids were given a Christian name when they started school at, at Chilago. Uh But whoever their parent was, whoever their father was, that was their last name. That's why William is called William Wonderwolf, because that was his adopted father's last name. As far as the first name goes, uh, they were just assigned one. Mm -hmm. uh, they had lists of names uh, that the kids could pick from, but none of them could read it. Yeah. So they said, okay, you're Amos, and you're William, and you're Robert. And so they, they got first and last name that way. What did his Indian name mean? I don't know. Okay. I haven't found a car that can tell me either. So, but uh, I, I went that when I did the down there, uh, there's a, a website called Descendants of Lone Wolf. And I thought, oh my God, here it is. I can find everything I need. And I have emailed and written and emailed and written and can't get a response. Uh, I went to the tribal headquarters and they said that really there wasn't a census of people prior to the Dawes Act, which did away with the reservation and chopped it up into allotments. That was when they took a head count of the tribes. So anything before that they didn't have a record of. Have you been to the historical society in Paul City? In where? Paul City. Uh -huh. They've got a lot of artifacts and information that the museum there. The, uh, the, uh, the tribal headquarters did suggest that I go to the college. They said a lot of the records were sent to some little college down there. But uh, I was tired of driving. So, so the headstone that's at Sedgwick in the cemetery, that is his headstone, right? Sedgwick. There's a headstone that says that. There is a headstone, and this is what, why I'm here, because I don't want to see you in the <laughs> funeral, but um, um, there, there's a headstone out there, and I remember as a little girl going over there, and I swear it says Lone Wolf on it. Oh, yeah. And I, I was, I always felt sorry because he never would have any flowers on his grave. So when I was a kid growing up, I'd always take flowers out that you know I that it just kind of what drew me here tonight <laughs> and, and a lot of people have questions and Cedric about that guy because it's just you know a lot of we we decided when we were little kids that he was the last Indian killed in Cedric that was good enough for us we, we, if we didn't know the truth we'd make it up I would get back to that there it is. That's a nice headstone. Yeah, it's nice. He, he was, Very well taken care of. Yeah, he was, uh, the, the thing up above there says, Woodman, Woodman of the Royal Memorial. Oh, yeah. Now, I'm not real familiar with Woodman of the Royal. I think it was something like the Masons or the... They're an organization that um, puts up headstones and that for the the working the working man, I think. Uh -huh. And they've got different ones. This is an unu this one is a normal looking headstone. I've seen some that look like big tree stumps. Uh, yeah. That. And yeah. they they're from this same organization. And they're all over the United States. And they're still active? I don't know. I don't know. They were in this time period here in, in Wellington because you can see those, the uh, articles, not articles, but their meeting notes in the paper. Oh, okay. What they did, I don't have a clue. <coughs> well, it had something to do with life insurance. Oh. <laughs> oh that. They, could you be. could buy life insurance by joining with of the world or something. Yeah, like probably so. There's just not a lot of information there. He had also, the, the year before he was killed, uh, was offered the job of a football coach in Sedgwick. Really? Yeah. Uh, wow. So, I, 
I suspect that he did one year of football, one season. Uh, it was not a winning season for the team. And either his athletic ability, probably his athletic ability, wasn't quite up to par because shortly after the football season ended, he was shipped back out to a farm to work for another six months. And uh, when he finished that last outing and came back to the schools, when he said, okay, I'm, I'm ready to leave now, and he filled out the paperwork, and at the bottom it said, reason for leaving, and he just wrote, self-sufficient. <laughs> I could do this now. And he did. He did, he did for the rest of his life. But there were a lot of downsides to it. I mean, the schools, the schools were brutal. Uh, a lot of runaways. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of Indians couldn't adapt. And uh, you know, you, you get into the, the stories of the drunken Indian, and, and uh, they can't handle their alcohol and, and stuff like that from people who just couldn't couldn't turn loose of one culture and, and embrace another one. You think that's, that's all I have? Yes, sir. Could I throw in a personal experience? Absolutely. In 1948, I played on a rolling high school baseball team. We were over the Shabbat that day. I played the Shabbat that Then in 1949, I played on the Singapore team, and we went over to play with the Shabbat that day. But they didn't have any lighting system, so we had to play an afternoon baseball game. Uh -huh. And for whatever reason, it, it was arranged that we go in in the morning. And we didn't object because the girls' home economic team, uh, home economic class, they fed us. They fed us good. <laughs> <laughs> so, when they had company, they had pretty good meals. So. Well, as I recall, uh, those students. Uh, we were a little out of class, especially in high school. They were allowed, those football players were, and baseball players were allowed to be 21 years old. Oh, really? 17, 16, 17, 18 year old, probably up against 20 and 21 year old men. Now, Lowell uh, had a, I believe he was an uncle uh, named Delos, D E L O S, Lowell, who was about 15 years older. Uh, and William, and he attended uh, uh, Carlisle, and I think maybe that was the reason why William had an in to get into Carlisle. Uh, uh, William was the younger, the, the man that probably adopted William in 1879, later took uh, his arguments against breaking up the reservation all the way to the Supreme Court. And uh, Dallas Lone Wolf went as interpreter for his brother or whatever the relationship is. He had all these Lone Wolves and he can't keep track. But, uh, but there is a, a Supreme Court decision saying, uh, no, the, the Indians lose. And uh, Lone Wolf the Younger went back to the to the area, uh, became a minister, uh, had a, a church way off away from everybody else. Uh, uh, the Lord Wolves were kind of renegades, they called them the implacables, because they wouldn't go along with, with white culture. And uh, Lord Wolf the other uh, banned white people from his church. So he was far enough out that he could get away with that, I guess. Well, we had a good time with, with, with the players over there, but I don't know what I was telling them, but really not, but sometimes they spoke in their Indian language, and some might say, oh, they're just all that bad thing. Oh, I don't know what I ever said in English or not. <laughs> it would be interesting if, I uh, don't know, probably not too many of the old folks left at the Congregation Church, you know, that we've been there with knew about him being a member of that church. Yeah, I haven't I haven't checked with the church there in St. Luke to see if they have any records of that his funeral was held in the congregational yeah. church. So 
you know, possibly there's some church records. Sure, we might have. But Saint Germain. Is he the only lone wolf you have in the cemetery? Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And tell us about your museum. Where are you open? Um, well, Saturday's ten to. Uh, we'd like to expand a little bit, but we don't see much reason to because the population of visitors is pretty small. Well, <laughs> but, there's a place to go visit. But that, uh, that gives me four hours a day to go in there and uh, uh, been doing a lot of preservation of their documents. And uh, whenever somebody brings something in, I make sure that it's labeled and catalogs. And, uh, so it's, it's fun. It's nice and fun. You guys recently moved the old uh, railroad depot. depot. Yeah, the, the, the Santa Fe Depot uh, used to sit on the railroad tracks, and uh, Santa Fe was going to knock it down back in the early 70s, late 60s. They were going to destroy it. Well, a guy in town named Jerry Mosevin uh, decided that he didn't want to see it torn down. So he had it moved to his property, which was uh, two or three blocks away. And it sat on Jerry's property for 30 years or more until uh, Jerry died, his wife deeded it to the Historical Society on the condition that we move it. So we uh, started raising money and uh, got the depot for the foundation and got the depot set behind the old building that was originally the museum and is still part of the museum, which is a doctor who was a doctor's office, a little one room wood frame building that has uh, a lot of the original uh, tables and uh, instruments and things like that in it. So, so it's really been fun to, to spread out the museum from that one little one room building back into a three room depot and be able to dig into all those big plastic bins and see exactly what we have because it's just been stored for so many yeah. years. Yeah. Okay. Well, our next meeting is going to be September the third Monday. Third Monday in September, and it's a Kansas Humanities speaker, Mr. Chavez, who's going to talk about the Cowboys. The Cowboys. The Cowboys. Yeah. Thank you again very, very much.